morning, everybody. Let's grab our Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 11, and we're back in our World Changer series. And I want to do a special shout out to Harvest Kumalani. I was just there, and it's so great to be with you guys, and I look forward to seeing you again in the month of November. But today in my message, I wanted to, I don't know, do you really need to hear me preach again? I mean, you see me every Sunday, and you know, it's actually been kind of a long time since you all have heard from Pastor Ricky Ryan. I mean, seriously, wouldn't you rather today hear a message from Pastor Ricky Ryan than me? Really, you're applauding for that? Now I'm feeling kind of bad because that's like a rejection. Okay, I'm just going to ignore that. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to preach to you today. My friend, Pastor Ricky Ryan, is going to bring the message. Let's welcome at Harvest Kumalani, Ricky Ryan. Are you guys ready for Pastor Ricky? Oh, yeah. Woohoo! Oh, Man, was that tricky or what? You guys were just absolutely set up for that. <laughs> hey, we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be looking at chapter 3. In fact, if Greg does a few more of these Harvest Crusades, we just might make it through the whole Gospel of Mark. <laughs> Mark chapter 3, let me read you starting in verse 1. And Jesus entered the synagogue again. And a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath, so they might accuse Jesus. And Jesus said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. Then Jesus said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? to save life or to kill. But they kept silent. So when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against Jesus how they might destroy him. Wow, what a passage. Father, thank you that you have brought us to this place on this Sunday. And we do thank you for Pastor Greg and all the great teaching we've received from him. And now, Holy Spirit, would you teach us again? Lord, I believe you have a message for each one here. It started with me. It's going to go through me now to each one. So, Holy Spirit, open our ears. Grab our attention. Speak to us now through your word. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, we're back again to that battle that was heating up between Jesus and the religious elite of the day. You remember that a group of rabbis, both scribes and Pharisees, and now, did you notice, some Herodians had been sent down by the powers that be in Jerusalem to check out this new teacher that was causing such a stir in Galilee. Word on the street was that this Jesus just might be the Messiah. And they want to find out if that's true or not. But then beyond that, they also wanted to know, was this new teacher a supporter of the religious establishment of the day? Or was he against it? Was he going to build up the leadership that was in place? Or was he going to tear it down? Now what they're beginning to see is that Jesus was a threat to the way they were doing business. And therefore, a threat to their power and position. And this was something that they would not stand for. Now in the previous run-in with Jesus in chapter 2, Jesus had showed them he had the power to heal. He had the power to forgive sins, both of which, you remember, were messianic signs. He had told them that he was the Lord of the Sabbath, meaning that he was the one who rested on the seventh day in the book of Genesis. Folks, that's quite a claim. It's an amazing claim. And that as Lord of the Sabbath, he declared that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And all of those things tweaked them to the max. All these things shattered their religious world. All of these things challenged their authority and their position. So they have to shut this down. 
Now their first attempt to do that would be right here in Mark chapter 3 in the synagogue at Capernaum. No, actually, we don't know for sure if this was the synagogue in Capernaum. It's our best guess. Jesus had made his center of operations Capernaum, so we think that's where this event took place. But what I want you to see here is that this whole thing was a setup. It was the first of many traps that the religious guys would set for Jesus, none of which would be successful. But here's where it all starts. The religious guys go out. They find a man with a withered hand. They plant him in the synagogue to see if Jesus would heal him on the Sabbath, which to them would be a clear violation of Sabbath traditions. You see in the Mishnah, the written traditions of the Jewish fathers, it stated that you could stabilize an injury on the Sabbath, but you couldn't take any action that would make it better because, you see, that would be working on the Sabbath. Like if you cut your finger on the Sabbath day, you could stop the bleeding, but you couldn't put ointment on it to make it heal faster or to keep it from infection. Do you see how crazy this had gotten? It was crazy. The Sabbath was no longer a day of rest. It was now a day of burden. But more than that, it gave these religious guys more of a hold over the people because they knew the rules. They made the rules, and the people didn't, so they had them. They also thought that they had Jesus as well. Now, I know what some of you students of the Bible are thinking right here. You're thinking, how do you know this guy was a plant? Well, we actually don't. But most scholars agree that something fishy is going on here, and Jesus certainly picks up on this in the way that he handles it. So chances are pretty good this was a full-blown trap. It really doesn't matter because the lessons and the response to the lessons still stand. So let's just see what happens in our text. It was a scene that was repeated a whole bunch of times. Jesus is going into the synagogue on the Sabbath to teach the people. As he enters in, he sees this man with a withered hand. Now, who is this guy? Well, we're not told who he is. It's interesting that in the Gospel of Hebrews, not, not the book of Hebrews in your Bible, but the Gospel of Hebrews, which is Jerome's commentary on the book of Matthew, he says this man was a plasterer. We have no idea if this is true or not, but we're told that a lot of oral traditions about Jesus and his ministry did make his way into recorded writings, and this perhaps is one of them. Now, if he was a plaster or any kind of tradesman, he needed both of his hands to do the job. With a withered hand, a hand that had lost all mobility and strength, he was out of work. So this guy was hurting in a lot of different ways, and hurting people always caught Jesus' attention. Always which is what these religious guys were counting on. Now something else caught Jesus' attention here, and that was the anticipation, the scheming of the religious elite of the day. Now this would have been hard to miss because the Pharisees and the scribes, and in this case the Herodians, would have been sitting in the front row. They liked those best seats in the house. They loved being front and center. Kind of like where Deborah is. This, you know, kind of <laughs> that location right there. And because Jesus knew the thoughts and intents of people's hearts, he knew they were lying in wait. He knew that they were waiting for him to take their bait and to heal this man. Now, I have to give you one more important piece of information here. You have to know that when Jesus steps into the synagogue, the religious elite feel like this is their home turf. Up to this point, they've confronted Jesus at Matthew's party. Certainly, that was not their home turf. They confronted him out in the fields when the disciples were picking grain on the Sabbath. But that was more like neutral ground. But you see, the synagogue they owned. This was their ballpark. This was their domain. They felt like they were in complete control here. Now, obviously, Jesus felt a little differently about this, didn't he? He laid claim of the synagogue as being his father's house. He'd get more and more forceful about this as time went on. But for now, they had Jesus right where they wanted him, on their home turf. That's why it wouldn't have been hard at all for them to set this whole thing up. So Jesus walks in. He looks at the whole situation. He knows something is up. In fact, he knows exactly what's up. 
He knows they want him to heal this man so they can accuse him of working on the Sabbath. I can just see these guys licking their chops while they're waiting for Jesus to take the bait. Well, Jesus doesn't mess around. He immediately goes on the offensive. He calls this man with the withered hand forward. And they're thinking, we have him. He's falling for it. But before he heals the man, he asks them a question. He asks the religious elite, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? Great question. <laughs> and it's a great question because it gets right to the heart of the matter. What was the Sabbath all about? Is it for good or for evil? Is it to save life or is it to kill? Which did God set this day aside for? You see, it's one or the other, isn't it? It's got to be one or the other. Now, a little side point here. The religious guys had made the Sabbath evil because it had become a day when the life was sucked out of the people instead of being pumped back into the people. You see, God wanted his people to be refreshed and stoked and revitalized on the Sabbath. And all their religious rules and interpretations had done just the opposite, which Jesus was trying to point out to them here. You see, Jesus never missed a teaching opportunity, but these guys didn't get it. But they still couldn't avoid the question, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? Now, it would have been crazy for them to say that doing evil or killing on the Sabbath was lawful because you know, everyone knew it, it just wasn't. That was not an option. To say it was lawful to do good on the Sabbath would have let Jesus off the hook. So in their case, there's no right answer. It's like when Jesus asked them if John the Baptist was a prophet from God or not. Do you remember that? If they said that John wasn't, well, the people would have revolted because they believed that John was a prophet from God. But if they said he was, then Jesus would have said, then why didn't you listen to him? Particularly his testimony about me. So they refused to answer, which is exactly what they do here. They look at each other and this, they just say, shoot, <laughs> he stumped us again. But folks, that's not the end of the story. There's so much more here. Look at verse 5. And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. Notice, notice. Jesus looked around at them with what? Do you see it? With anger. I want you to think about this. That these, these were real men here. And there apparently, there were, there were lots of them. And Jesus went from man to man, looking them right in the eye as his eyes burned with anger. Folks, I don't know about you, but that's a look I, I never want to receive from Jesus. Never. But they did. Each and every one of them received it. Now, I've heard people say all the times that Jesus never got mad, never got angry, and that we as followers of Christ, we should never get mad or angry either. Usually you hear this from people who've never read the Bible. And they're mad at us because we're taking stands on certain issues. We're mad about certain things. See, they believe that Jesus is all about love, tolerance, and acceptance, and we should be as well. But folks, mark this. Mark this. Jesus got mad. There were times when his anger burned. Now, I'm sure you remember the two times that Jesus cleared the money changers out of the temple with a whip. That was not Jesus meek and mild by any stretch of the imagination. No, he was angry. And he used violent actions to express that anger. And notice this. No one messed with Jesus when he was mad. No, no one. <laughs> no one stepped up toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jesus. Uh-uh. When Jesus was mad, they just got out of the way. Now, I don't say this to justify Christians using violence. I believe that violent actions should always be used as a last resort, if at all. But I do say this to tell you as believers 
that there are a lot of things going on right now out in our world that should make your blood boil. There are evil things that are happening in our world that should make us fighting mad. You know, I'd actually like to see Christians get a little more riled up. I would. I'd like to see Christians get a little more exercised over some of the things that are happening in our world today. Now, most of you know that in Australia, they've removed all mentions of God and faith from their governmental statements, and they've become a purely secular society. I was asking some of our pastors who are down there what they did about that, and all of them said, you know, we didn't do anything about it. And now they regret that. Many of them told me they wish they'd put up more of a fight, but you see, it just didn't make them angry enough. Folks, Jesus got angry. And these guys felt his anger. Don't miss this. The Greek tense that's used here for anger, the anger of Jesus, is in the aorist tense, which means that it was momentary. It was like a, like a flash of anger. But it was anger that did not lead to sin. See, there's a righteous anger. There's righteous indignation. For it to be righteous, though, there has to be a limit to it. And it cannot lead us to sinful actions. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 4, be angry, but don't what? Sin. Don't sin. Right. And then don't let the sun go down on your anger. Folks, that's great advice. That's really good advice. D don't ever let your anger lead you into sinful actions. Don't ever let it do that. And no matter how angry you get at the stuff going on around you, when you lay your head on the pillow at night, that's it. That's the end of it. Right there. Leave it there. Leave it there. Confess it to God. Repent from it. Turn from it. And let God handle it. He said, well, then what do I do about those things that are going on day after day that keep making me mad day after day? Well, you channel that anger into righteous actions and responses. You allow that anger to propel you into something good. It's like mad. Do you know about mad? Mothers against drunk drivers. See, instead of stewing over the fact that there are drunk drivers out there on the road right now that could kill more people, they've channeled that anger into a movement that gets those drivers off the streets. That's righteous indignation. That is anger used the right way. Jesus was angry, but his anger never controlled him. If our anger is controlling us, it's sin. We can't go there. He took his momentary anger and he channeled it into something good. But then along with his anger, his anger, there's something else was happening, which we also find in verse 5. It says he was grieved by the hardness of their hearts. You see, what made Jesus mad here was the hearts of these religious guys. They should have been open. They should have been soft. They should have been anticipating a move of God and the coming of the Messiah. But that wasn't happening. Their hearts had become hard and closed. And it grieved him. It made him sad. And can I tell you the source of their hardness? It's pride. Every time. Pride. In Proverbs 6 it tells us there are seven things that God hates. Did you know there are seven things that God hates? Seven things. At the top of the list, it's pride. That haughty look. God hates pride. Self-preservation. Self-centeredness because it fossilizes our hearts. It closes our hearts down. And see, that's what happened to these religious guys. Their pride, their position had so puffed them up that they saw Jesus more as a threat than they saw him as being the Messiah. Instead of being thrilled by his healings, his ability to forgive sin, his desire to bring the kingdom to sinners, and him being the Lord of the Sabbath, they felt threatened by it. How sad this had to be to Jesus that the men that were supposed to represent him had become his enemies and it grieved him. Again, the Greek tense here, very interesting. The word grieved is in the perfect tense, which means that it is a continual, ongoing process. His anger was just for a moment, but his grief at the hardness of their hearts, it would continue on. See, Jesus didn't hold a grudge against this guy. No, he, he was just saddened by them. 
He felt sorry for them. And I believe that each and every one of those men knew that. They knew that. Now, all this time, remember the poor guy with a withered hand? All right? He's just been standing up there in front with his withered hand. He kind of got lost in the shuffle, but not for long. Look at the end of verse 5. Then Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. Notice that Jesus asked this man to do the impossible. He asked him to stretch forth his withered hand. This was something he couldn't do. But folks, that's the way of faith, isn't it? It's the way of faith. Faith oftentimes demands that we do the impossible. It demands that we step out and do things that we just don't think we can do. I bet when this guy heard this, he thought to himself, listen, pal, if I could stretch forth my hand, I wouldn't be standing up here in front of all these people. Nevertheless, Jesus had put this demand on him. Stretch forth your hand. Now let me tell you what else Jesus is doing here. He was getting this man to expose his need. And we hate this, don't we? We don't want people to see our need. We don't want people to see where we're deformed or shriveled or paralyzed. No, we want people to think we've got it all together. We want people to think we're whole in every way. We want them to see our strong hand, not our weak, shriveled hand. But this brings us back to that old saying, the only need that Jesus can't meet is the need that we don't reveal. You know one of the things that makes our prayer time up in front of the church so powerful is that people aren't afraid to stretch out their withered hand. They're not afraid to come up here and make their need known and say, I need help. I need God. And because they do that, God meets those needs week after week. He'll do it again this morning, right here. See, Jesus forced this man to reveal his need so he could meet his need. Last thing I want you to see here is that Jesus made this man do it publicly within the community of the synagogue. Now, there were a couple of times when Jesus did some private healings, but the vast majority of his healings were out in the open for all to see. And that's, again, a little uncomfortable for us, isn't it? We want our religion to be this private thing between us and God. We don't want to put our spirituality on display. But that's not the way God does it. When Jesus calls someone, he calls them openly publicly. When Jesus healed someone, most of the time he did it out in the open so everyone could see it. And see what this forces is community. It binds us together. You know, and that's the, one of the reasons I love our baptisms down in the Pelee Bay is because we can just get a whole bunch of people down there out in the open, in the public. And we take these people out in the water, and man, we hold them down. We get them, we just, we get them down there, and we hold them, we're still on them down in that water. And when we bring them up, I tell you, people are cheering, shouting, they're alive! They're pretty happy, it's great. But when those people come up out of the water, and those people are cheering, and they're praising God, and they're singing praise to God, listen, they know they're a part of something good. They know they're a part of something good. They feel part of that community. And the people who witness that say, man, I want to be part of that community. I want a piece of that. It's powerful. See, this man was going to be healed. But he'd be healed in the midst of his brothers and sisters. I like that. So the man does what Jesus asked. And in faith, he stretches forth his hand. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. I love the fact that Mark throws in that this was a total complete healing. It was made as good as new. It wasn't close almost. It wasn't better than it was. It wasn't slightly functional. No, it was restored as whole as the other. Now, can you imagine being in that congregation when that happened? Can you imagine seeing that guy stretch forth his withered hand and have it become perfect? Oh, they were praising God. There was joy in Capernaum. There was stoke in that congregation. I bet people were going crazy. Now, contrast that. Hold that thought. Contrast that with those who had the hardened hearts that saw the same event. Look at verse 6. Then the Pharisees went out 
and immediately plotted with the Herodians against Jesus how they might, what? Destroy him. Oh man, what a sharp contrast. On the one hand, open hearts, soft hearts. They see a move of God. Great joy. God's on the move. They're stoked. The others with a hard heart, they start a plot to destroy the healer. Now, it takes a long time for those, that plot to develop. But the seeds for that plot were planted right here. If we get a chance to go through the rest of this gospel, we'll watch those seeds of hatred grow. It's interesting to watch that. Now, as we close this morning, let me bring up a couple of points of application for us here today. First one's pretty obvious, isn't it? It's pretty obvious. How are our hearts this morning? What's the condition of your heart today? Where is it? Is it soft? Is it pliable? Is it thankful? Grateful to God? Or is your heart hard? and closed, and bitter. See, this may be within the context of your marriage. Maybe the context of your family. Maybe it's, it's right here with some people in our church. Maybe it's your business or your work. What's going on there? It's just, ooh, it's hardening your heart. It might even be with the transition we're going through as a church right now. It's not easy, is it? It's hard. It's really hard. Most churches don't survive it. We're surviving it. We're surviving it. But it's hard. But in any of these areas, has your heart grown cold and hard? Has it shut down in any of these areas? Listen, folks, I know how easy that can happen. It happens to me all the time. All the time. And remember, the source of this hardness always comes back to pride, self-centeredness, and self-preservation. This is why God hates these things. They fossilize our hearts. And if you find yourself in that place today where your heart has gotten hard and you want to do something about it, man, I got great news for you. I got great news for you. Listen to what God says in Ezekiel 36, 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and you will keep my judgments and do them. How good is that? If your heart has gotten hard and stony, God says, look, I'll forgive you of all the sin that got you there. And then I'll take that stony heart out. I'll I'll take it right out of you. And I'll put in a soft, fleshly heart. And then I will fill you with my Holy Spirit. Folks, that's a deal you can't refuse. It's too good. It's too good. And if that's your need, we're going to give you a chance this morning to let God do that right here. In our prayer time this morning, that's going to be our focus. Getting those stony hearts out and getting those soft and fleshly hearts in. It's going to happen right here. Here's the second point of application. Are you ready? Is there a need in you this morning that needs to be exposed? Is there a withered hand? Is there a deformed attitude? Is there a twisted habit that needs to be brought into the light so that Jesus can heal it? The only need that Jesus can heal is the need that we won't expose. And some of us, we just need to expose those things. We just need to bring them to the altar and say, look, Jesus, look at my hand, look at my heart, look at my attitude. Look at this twisted habit in me. It's got to go. And God says, man, I will heal you. I will heal you. I will make you whole. You know what the enemy wants? The enemy wants you to keep that thing hidden. He, he, He doesn't want anyone to know your disability. He wants you to walk out of here this morning with that shriveled hand hidden in your coat. Don't do it. Don't do it. No, stretch out your hand before the Lord. Take that step of faith. Bring it into the light so that Jesus can do his wonderful, powerful work in you. Father, thank you for 
this passage of scripture. Lord, I know this passage. It was for me. Hallelujah. Because you know that my heart can get hard. You know about those areas of my life that are withered and twisted and need to be brought into the light. And Lord Jesus, I'm so thankful for your cure today. You just say, bring it to me. Bring that heart to me, and I'll give you a new one. I'll take away the sin that got you there. I'll take that stony heart out, and I'll put a fleshly heart in. <laughs> wow. And I will fill you with my Holy Spirit. What a deal. If we just bring that shriveled hand to you, Lord, you'll make it whole. So, Father, right now in the life of our church, Lord, even as you did in the first service, I pray you blow our minds. You do miracles right here. You bind us together as a church right here as we come and say, God, here's my need. Here's what I need today. Jesus, thank you that you are living, you're alive, you're powerful, you're moving in our midst, and you're going to do miracles right here today. So, Lord Jesus, you do that right now. Give us the faith to respond to your word. In Jesus' name, amen.